So for now, I'm happy to cede the stage for this evening's presentation from Caroline Weber. Um, just a few words about her biography. Um, professor Weber is um, a professor of French and comparative literature at Barnard College and Columbia University, where she specializes in the literature and history of the Ancien Regime, the Enlightenment, and the French Revolution. She's the author of many books, uh, including Terror and Its Discontents, Suspect Words in Revolutionary France from 2003, Queen of Fashion, What Marie Antoinette Wore to the Revolution from 2006, and Proust's Duchess from 2018, which won the French Heritage Society Book Award. And in addition to publishing for those academic forums, she's also contributed uh, articles to such outlets as the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, New York Magazine, and many others. Um, so we're delighted to have her here today giving us this background on Marie Antoinette, Queen of Fashion, the French tradition of royal taste making. And um, Professor Weber is going to talk for about 40 minutes, and then we'll have a good chunk of time for questions. So as she is speaking, um, do be brainstorming as we proceed, and then we'll love to have a discussion at the end. Uh, I cede the screen. Welcome, Professor Weber. Thank you for having me, and I'm going to set an alarm for myself <laughs> right now. And uh, thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. Thank you, Opera Lafayette, Jace Chambers, Ryan Brown. Thank you, Julia Doe. And uh, yes, as you mentioned, I, I wrote my book about Marie Antoinette some years ago. So it was a pleasure for me to get to revisit that material, but also really to think about it in a way that would make sense as a kind of framing device or contextual frame for uh, for what you'll be doing in the rest of this series. Uh, to that end, I wanted to walk you through uh, the French tradition of royal taste making, really uh, focusing on the two previous dominant taste makers who preceded Marie Antoinette in the century prior to her arrival at Versailles as a 15-year-old bride in 1770. Um, and those two tastemakers, because of course the French tradition of royal tastemaking goes back even farther than the 17th century, but the most germane and important ones for Marie Antoinette's purposes and for ours uh, were the two that preceded her, the first being Louis XIV, an ancestor of Marie Antoinette herself, as well as of her husband, importantly. And the second is Madame de Pompadour, who was actually uh, in no small part responsible for the fairly new alliance between France and Austria that um, led to the marriage of Marie Antoinette, a daughter of the Austrian Empress Maria Theresa, with the heir to the French throne, the, first, the future Louis XVI. Um, so uh, I want to give you a little bit of information about both Louis XIV and Madame de Pompadour and their tastemaking activities, and then we'll speak in more detail about Marie Antoinette as both a kind of a continuation of that tradition, but also as a, um, somebody who took that tradition in her own uh, very interesting and far-reaching directions. So to begin, Louis XIV. Um, Many of you know plenty about Louis XIV already, but of course he's famous as the Sun King, as the great mastermind of Versailles, as the, uh, the solidifier of royal absolutism in the 17th century. And taste making became a really important tool of propaganda for Louis XIV, uh, who was a child when he came to the throne in an age of civil war in France. And it was a period known as the Fronde, where um, fractious noblemen were essentially contesting royal authority uh, that his father, who died prematurely, Louis XIII, had tried to kind of concentrate in royal hands. So there uh, were nobles with sort of independent centers of power all over France who didn't want to cede their privileges and their, um, and their authority to the king. And uh, Louis XIV essentially grew up in the middle of a civil war that could have gone either way. Uh, finally, the men um, and Louis XIV's mother and regent, uh, Anne of Austria, managed to break the rebellion, but Louis XIV never forgot the, of this period of noble rebellions against the throne. And he effectively set out to establish his own personal prestige, his cultural prestige, and his political prestige, all as part of the same program of royal absolutism and unquestioned mastery over the rest of the nation, including the nobles. 
Um, uh, one of the results of that that I'd like to talk about, especially today, is the rise of the French luxury trades and fashion, but there were many more. And this is only a very cursory look at Louis' achievements. Uh, there were more than I could talk about today and more than were relevant to our discussion of Marie Antoinette. Um, so in the fine arts, the thing I really want to just emphasize here is that Louis XIV, who assumed personal power, who basically um, got rid of any other uh, governing assistance from a Mazarin or from his mother in 1661, when he rose to the throne, one of his earliest preoccupations was to project an image of majesty and power. And he did that in a number of ways. Um, there's a fine book that's been written about this subject, several, but my favorite is by um, uh, Louis Marin called The Portrait of the King, uh, where it talks about different likenesses of Louis XIV that circulated uh, as part of an absolutist program in the 17th century. Uh, some of my favorites from this period are um, Bernini's equestrian statuary of uh, Louis XIV as a mythological conquering hero. Um, to my right, there's a contemporary portrait of Louis XIV, whose great ambition was to be a war hero and an empire builder. Um, and then in the center, this is Louis XIV's debut, and this is actually before he took personal power. This is from when Louis XIV, the center image is Louis XIV dancing as the sun god Apollo in 1753, when he was still a teenager. Um, but the sun king, of course, became his, his favorite persona, and that was a persona that he writ large in his architectural masterpiece that will forever be associated with his name, uh, Versailles. So Versailles, many of you are probably already aware, had been a modest hunting lodge in the days of Louis XIV's father. Uh, he took it and completely uh, rehabbed it, extended it, um, and turned it into really a sort of a um, uh, not only the most glamorous and dazzling and awe-inspiring palace in Europe, but also really a stage set for the daily pageantry of royalty that he introduced as a keystone of his absolutist um, program. So one of the things that Versailles became useful for him uh, for, practically speaking, was that he required all of the great noblemen of France to come and live with him at this court. And this was really a double-edged sword. On the one hand, um, as La Briere, one of the moralists from this period, famously wrote something like, the only worse thing than having to be at the court is not getting to be at the court. Uh, so you didn't want to be excluded, but to be included essentially meant that you were conscripted into this daily ritualized 24-7 uh, worship of the monarch. Uh, it meant that all of your money was spent no longer on maintaining private uh, private armies in your uh, territories, in your respective uh, duchies and counties. It meant that you were spending all of your money on elegant clothes, on gambling, on other entertainments at court. Louis XIV encouraged his nobles to go broke uh, because it also increased their dependency on him. And um, he essentially turned them into this constant audience to his his majesty and his might. And the interior spaces of Versailles, which I can't remember if I gave you a slide for that or not. Uh, no, I didn't. But the Hall of Mirrors, the Salon de la Guerre et de la Paix, um, the gardens, uh, which were beautifully manicured and essentially became an exterior stage set for, uh, the, for the monarch's constant show of power and grandeur. Uh, all of these things reinforced a message of unquestioned and unparalleled authority and might. Uh, the nice side effect for the history of French culture in all of this is that uh, Louis XIV gave jobs to a lot of very talented architects, landscape designers, workers in the decorative arts, fine craftsmen, um, as well as painters and sculptors, a few of whom um, I, I mentioned before, and particularly bringing Bernini to France as um, his Valois forebear, um, Francois Premier had famously brought Leonardo da Vinci to France at the beginning of the 16th century. So uh, he's bringing all these artists, these fine craftsmen who are at the top of their game, decorating Versailles on the inside and on the outside. And he also sets a fashion, uh, both for a French Baroque architectural style, uh, which Versailles epitomized and defined, and also for the famous uh, Jardin à la Française, these neatly manicured, uh, strictly geometric, carefully laid out, perfectly planned, impeccable French gardens um, designed by Le Nôtre. 
Um, so this is part of Louis' contribution to the arena of taste, and of course, the Jardin à la Française and everything Baroque and everything Louis XIV uh, becomes in particularly looms large in the sort of European imagination more broadly, um, in part because of his contributions as well to the performing arts. And I was telling uh, Julia Doe before uh, this presentation began that um, I am not a music historian and music has always been the art form that I felt the least comfortable writing about because I know the least about it. But I did want to mention his important patronage of Jean-Baptiste Lully, known as the father of French opera. And Lully kind of has a revival in the 18th century that we'll talk about in a moment. But uh, in patronizing Lully, who was born in Italy, but who really helped to elaborate a French style of opera, uh, Louis XIV established himself as somebody who was uh, crucial to the evolution of that genre. Uh, he appointed Lully the Academy Royale, uh, the director of the Academy Royale de Musique, later the Paris Opera. And in fact, fun fact, he and Lully first met and became friendly when uh, Lully was dancing alongside Louis XIV in this um, ballet uh, royale where he played the sun god Apollo. Uh, so on your right, you see here actually staged at um, Louis' brother's residence in Paris, the Palais Royal, uh, one of Lully's most successful uh, operas from his early years with Louis XIV. And then to the left is just a picture of the man himself that somebody tinted in color in the 19th century. Uh, another important part of French style and French culture that Louis XIV was absolutely fundamentally important in developing was French fashion. Uh, so I mentioned before that Louis XIV dreamed of being an empire builder and uh, conquering other nations and, and claiming them for France, uh, in addition to uh, building this incredibly expensive castle that uh, he was going, went through renovations and additions and variations throughout uh, Louis XIV's entire life, uh, that called for money. And the best way to earn money besides letting the nobles go broke at your palace and taxing uh, the non-nobles and the non-clergy within an inch of their lives, the best way to raise more income for France was to develop an, uh, to develop an export business. And Louis XIV, with the advice of his probably greatest minister, Jean-Baptiste Colbert, uh, presided over the founding of a number of really important French luxury trades that promptly became important engines for French economic development that provided huge export business for France at, at, in a kind of in a role that France is still very comfortable in today as an exporter of the finest things in life. Um, Louis XIV in particular himself loved fashion, loved beautiful clothes. So when he and Colbert uh, supported, for instance, the, the silk manufacturers, the silk weavers of Lyon, uh, it became an excuse to wear and to make his nobles wear uh, the most colorful, extravagant, beautifully artistically embroidered, uh, finest French textiles. Uh, Paris became a hub for fashion design. Uh, Louis XIV, is, uh, to my knowledge, the first uh, French sovereign ever to appear in a in his own likeness in a French fashion engraving. Uh, fashion journals as such hadn't been invented in the 17th century, but Louis XIV's own likeness appeared uh, as kind of the, the poster child for this French court style. Uh, the high heels with the red soles designating uh, nobility or royalty, these velvet jackets and silk jackets with this incredibly beautiful lace and embroidery, uh, all of it, the long flowing hair, uh, the expensive plumes, which are only uh, featured a little bit in his tricorn hat here, the silk stockings, all of this was incredibly refined, but also incredibly flamboyant and re um, represented a stark departure from what had previously constituted European royal fashion conventions, and those had been set by the Spanish Habsburgs, arguably the greatest uh, sovereigns of their era a hundred years before. Uh, Louis XIV was a Habsburg on his mother's side, uh, but essentially the sort of plain, sober, Black silk, uh, black itself was a luxury item in um, in Habsburg Spain and throughout Europe in the Habsburg's heyday because black dye was expensive, but it was a very sober, restrained look. These kind of stiff white ruffs uh, couldn't have been a farther cry from the uh, the styles that Louis the Fourteenth 
proudly developed and favored. Um, and he also, as I mentioned in my slide here, he became a bellwether not only for men's fashions, but he became a bellwether for men's hairstyle fashions, uh, a, a, um, a monopoly that women like Madame de Pompadour and Marie Antoinette will take up for female hairstyles in the 18th century. Um, but anyway, he becomes this bellwether of French fashion. He establishes France as the center of fashion. Um, he establishes Versailles as the most fashionable place on earth because his nobles are all required to wear uh, these clothes. That, and you could see, you could look at somebody's dress often at Versailles and know how important they were in the carefully elaborated pecking order of the court. Depending on how noble you were, how well born you were, you might have to wear, if you were a woman, a more or less rigid corset. You might be allowed to have more or fewer uh, layers of lace on your sleeves. If you were one of Louis XIV's, I think, 40 favorite courtiers, you were allowed to wear a special blue silk jacket that automatically enabled anyone to pick you out as somebody enjoying special royal favor. Um, so clothing also became a way, importantly under Louis XIV, to signal power, to signal social hierarchy, to signal um, uh, affinity for or affiliation with and obedience to the crown. Uh, by the time Madame de Pompadour, the favorite mistress and the most influential mistress of Louis XIV's successor, Louis XV, by the time Madame de Pompadour came along, um, fashion had really stultified at Versailles. Uh, Louis XIV uh, died a very old man in 1715. He was succeeded first by a regent from, the, from his brother's branch of the family, and then by his five-year-old great-grandson, Louis XV, who never particularly cared about um, fashion or luxury or the fine arts. He cared a little bit about science and he was very proud of his ability to make a cup of hot chocolate all by himself. Uh, but otherwise he was not interested in taking up the mantle of style arbiter that had been left behind by his predecessor and namesake. Um, and so there was kind of a void around the monarch Louis XV in the early years of his reign. And um, fashion uh, basically remained the same at Versailles with kind of very minor uh, modifications until the middle of the century when uh, Louis XV took up with a brilliant and very well-educated, very ambitious, very cultured woman from the bourgeoisie, uh, Jeanne Antoinette Poisson. Uh, the French word for fish was something that the nobles liked to make fun of in this bourgeois woman without a noble last name. Uh, but she was the best thing that could have ever happened to French culture because she was very interested in taking up this uh, baton that had really been left unheld since the days of Louis XIV and defining French taste all over again. Uh, she injected newness and, and vitality into the kind of stagnant, tired, demode French Baroque that had been kicking around at Versailles uh, since Louis XIV's death. So in the, in, the, in the realm of the fine arts, um, uh, we see uh, Madame de Pompadour most often, uh, and best, the best known portraits of her are portraits of her by her favorite uh, painter, Boucher. And um, we see her in these kind of quintessentially Rococo clothings and clothing and settings and and Rococo represents the important uh, next step in the evolution of French taste after the French Baroque and it's really a reaction against the French Baroque uh, where the Baroque is kind of imposing and awe-inspiring and heavy and pompous the Rococo is playful and sensuous and sinuous and and intimate and a little bit naughty and uh, you can see that Boucher really captured um, a Madame de de Pompadour's Rococo sensibility, her Rococo tastes, even in the, the atmospheres that he uh, depicts her in. So on her, your left, um, in this 1759 portrait by Boucher, we see her in the garden of one of her 15, her fi she had 15 residences, and one of her favorite of these residences uh, was called the Chateau de Bellevue, that had these very romantic um, kind of wild gardens that were very, very different to the Jardin à la Française of Versailles. And Madame de Pompadour dressed for these gardens, dressed for these environments in soft, uh, pastel, delicate tones. Uh, she loved to accessorize with real and silk flowers. She uh, favored a kind of floral and vine embroidery on her dresses. She added lots of ribbons and bows and got rid of lots of heavy 
jewelry and gold braid. And um, so you can see this kind of lightness of the Rococo uh, in this portrait by Boucher of, from 1759, and then uh, showing a slightly different but equally Pompadourian color palette. The jewel tones of Madame de Pompadour were another Rococo signature, including a nice deep rosy pink that became known all over Europe as Pompadour Pink. Uh, and here, even though we have Madame de Pompadour uh, inside uh, lounging in one of her private apartments, uh, caught in a pensive moment uh, over reading a book, uh, we can see the difference between the kind of rigid, formalized style of uh, Louis XIV and his court and this more relaxed, uh, intimate, uh, modern and fresh uh, way of appearing, of dressing, of being painted, and of decorating your house and garden. So this is the aforementioned Chateau de Bellevue, uh, which was completed in around 1750. Uh, we see here um, a kind of a great visual example, if you contrast it to what the facade of Versailles looked like, uh, just what Madame de Pompadour was trying to do in defining tastes away from and against the aesthetic that had been set in stone and in marble and in ormolu uh, by Louis XIV at Versailles. Uh, the Chateau de Bellevue and her other hermitages or Maison de Plaisance uh, were really um, little more than kind of large, comfortable country houses. And they were meant to feel and to look like that. This one is only two stories. It's got kind of a simple square plan flanked nicely symmetrically by these little outbuildings with a very pared down, unfussy facade where everything about this house, everything about this retreat, retreat was meant to signal privacy, a life away from the court. Louis XIV in his flamboyance and in his um, ambition to maintain an absolutist stranglehold over his noble subjects was very happy to be the center of royal pageantry all day, every day at Versailles, where his least act was theatricalized, watching him eat, watching him get dressed, watching him go to mass, watching him walk through the hall of mirrors every day, just as the sun is shining in to make him look like the sun god. All of these uh, ritualized, formalized ceremonies that the king underwent every day, um, uh, according to Louis XIV's plans, had become very suffocating, not only to the people around Louis XV, like Madame de Pompadour, but to Louis XV himself. So he was very pleased to be able to escape Versailles and to go away to these kind of private retreats that his mistress had set up for his and her enjoyment, really effectively uh, kind of a counterpart to Versailles, which had political implications because it, it really represented a challenge to the absolutist monopoly on taste and even on royal attention as well as on um, uh, royal authority. Uh, at her Maison de Plaisance and in her, uh, her private Théâtre des Petits Appartements, Madame de Pompadour, who is a great reader, a sponsor and um, patron of uh, many of the philosophes and uh, uh, Diderot and Voltaire uh, in particular, was a great lover of, of theater. Um, she was also a lover of music and um, she enjoyed staging private theatricals also away from the constant theatricality of Versailles. And her tastes in music, about which um, more can be said by my musical history, my uh, musicology uh, colleagues and other experts who are um, listening to this talk, uh, but you can see that there's a consistency between the kind of pastoral opera that, for instance, she famously staged um, at her Théâtre des Petits Appartements um, by Lully, a revival from a late work by Lully, uh, that this was kind of a, a pastoral, um, idyllic work that was meant, again, to be on a smaller, more human scale. Uh, it was set romantically in nature. Um, a very brilliant a graduate student of mine and Julia Doe's called Colin Black, Colin Blackmore wrote a great paper for me about um, Pompadour's staging of this opera. And he talks about how, if you look at, she's this little figure in white um, at the leftmost edge of the slide showing the performance. Not only is she playing the starring role, effectively taking the gaze away from the king in the audience, and placing it on herself, but also she's in an outfit that essentially makes it look like she's part of the landscape. Uh, this romantic, rocky, craggy backdrop, uh, which replicated uh, the look of some of her Rococo gardens at Bellevue and her other residences, uh, is something that's also reprised in her very dress, which is encrusted with uh, stones and seashells.
Isles or Hokai, which is in fact the, um, the origin of the, the term Rokoko. Uh, so she becomes part of this environment, which in itself is this perfect French uh, Rococo counterpart that is a distinct and pointed departure from the aesthetics and the power statements of Versailles. Uh, another way in which Pompadour um, notoriously rebelled against the strictures and conventions of style at Versailles was uh, she hated the formal French habit de cour that had been de rigueur for women, and there was a male version too ever since Louis XIV. Uh, so in the center slide, I'm showing you a, uh, a portrait of Louis XV's largely ignored and neglected Polish-born queen, Maria Leczynska, in a classic uh, habit de cour, a female habit de cour. You see the very stiff stomacher, uh, the, the kind of intensely brocaded, heavy, weighty colors, the ermine robe signifying royalty, the wide uh, hoop skirts or pannier, and the long train, and then these insignia of her royalty, these uh, lily flowers or bourbon fleur de lis on her train uh, that couldn't have been more or different from the sassy little uh, numbers that Madame de Pompadour liked to wear, especially when entertaining the king and friends in private. Uh, so uh, both of these uh, portraits show her in these kind of gauzy little um, uh, almost shift dresses that she liked to accessorize, again, with her signature ribbons and flowers. Uh, the only jewelry she wears in this Boucher portrait of 1758 is a bracelet bearing a cameo of her lover, Louis XV, uh, but she's not wearing a lot of diamonds. She's not wearing pearls. She's not wearing important uh, gems. She's signaling or as we would say in um, sort of RuPaul's uh, drag race lingo, uh, she's serving naturalness. She's serving a lack of artifice. She's serving a lack of adornment here. Um, she's giving nature, she's giving Rococo. She's moving away from artifice, even if of course her, root, her cheeks are perfectly rouged to match the pompadour pink of her ribbons. Um, and even if she's kind of unconvincing and stiff looking, posing as a beautiful gardener lady uh, in the portrait by Van Lo at our right. Again, there, all you see are her signature ribbons, this kind of simple little hat and some pretty little silk flowers in her hair and on her bodice uh, to match or echo the real flowers in her hands and in her basket. Uh, another kind of dressing down fashion that she was uh, famous for developing was the, um, the Turkish dress. Uh, which had a real moment in the late 1740s and early 1750s. And uh, at this point, uh, Madame de Pompadour was so much more interesting and fashion forward and the kinds of clothes she was wearing than anybody else at court that she had effectively become a fashion leader even for the many, many nobles and royals who resented her power and her influence over the king. Uh, one of her bitterest enemies was a daughter of her lover, Louis XV, uh, Madame Adélaïde de France, uh, Marie Adélaïde was her full name. And even though uh, Madame Adelaide detested Madame de Pompadour and did everything she could to try to topple her uh, from her position of power as the king's official recognized mistress, um, Madame Adelaide uh, jumped quickly on the uh, Turkish dress bandwagon and had her favorite uh, portrait of herself painted in that garb. Uh, and here we also see Madame de Pompadour's interest in kind of uh, Orientalism, an early version of Oriental. Uh, these headdresses, this little kind of uh, pseudo Turkish or pseudo Ottoman toque is another fanciful French luxury um, interpretation of uh, Turkish fashion. Uh, Madame de Pompadour had, of course, never traveled to Turkey and neither had um, Madame Adelaide. Uh, there was a backlash not all against Madame de Pompadour and her considerable influence as a tastemaker, having uh, usurped effectively a role that had been explicitly identified before her era with the absolutist monarch himself, there was a backlash against this that uh, played itself out not only in the many internecine battles and uh, kind of petty factions and rivalries at court, uh, a number of which were organized around Louis XV's daughters who hated her, um, and also among various enemies of her relatively liberal political and social policies, uh, these, uh, these sort of um, resentments against Madame de Pompadour also wound up playing themselves out in uh, the visual culture of France during her time. Uh, a series of caricatures known as poissonade, 
referencing again her shamefully bourgeois last name, maiden name, Poisson or Fish, uh, showing uh, Madame de Pompadour on the left. We see there's a little message written underneath saying basically that Madame de Pompadour now has so much influence over the king that he even just wants to do embroidery like she does. So we have Cupid handing Louis XV uh, this little um, embroidery hoop. Uh, Madame de Pompadour was also loved embroidery and loved gem carving and other little miniature kind of or feminine decorative arts uh, that were an important part of her legacy, but I can't talk about them here. But here we see Louis XV effectively symbolically being uh, feminized or castrated by being reduced to uh, kind of Madame de Pompadour's acolyte in the realm of the feminine decorative arts. Uh, on the far right, uh, Madame de Pompadour is the female figure at the bottom of this well, um, and you can see the dress that she's wearing is this kind of filmy, gauzy, almost see-through nightgown that I believe is meant to look like one of the little shift dresses she was wearing in the Boucher portraits I just showed you. And what these people are doing is they're all throwing, they're melting down all of their silver to pay for her many residences, to pay for her fashion frivolities, uh, to pay for all of her whims that are now setting the tone uh, for um, elite style at the court and in the upper reaches of the bourgeoisie, the money bourgeoisie in Paris. And, and then in the center, there were also constant accusations that maybe she was sleeping around with men besides the king. Uh, these were unlikely, but in this center image, uh, we see Madame de Pompadour in a cartoon on a ladder trying to kiss a man she was supposedly having an affair with whose claim to fame was his incredible height. But the thing that captured my attention about this poissonade, this image from this poissonade, is that it um, reprises the beautiful green and pink jewel toned dress from the Boucher uh, portrait of a few slides back. Uh, so uh, being the tastemaker, assuming this royal role of tastemaking is not without its perils, Madame de Pompadour eventually died fairly young and exhausted of smallpox in 1764, but her last important political act was, as I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, to broker a, um, a, an alliance with Austria, which had traditionally been France's enemy, and that is how Marie Antoinette came into the fold, marrying Louis XV's successor and grandson, the future Louis XVI in 1770. And, uh, Louis, and uh, like Louis XV before him, Louis XVI had no interest in being a style leader. He also hated the, the, the rigid court ceremonies of Versailles. He hated having any attention placed on him at all. And so Marie Antoinette wound up being quite happy to step into the role that uh, Louis XIV and then uh, Maria and then uh, Madame de Pompadour had enjoyed uh, as really this the sort of the center for every eye, the person who dictates what style will be at the court. Marie Antoinette inadvertently launched a fashion early on in her years at court uh, because she figured out quickly that her husband wasn't uh, was very shy. He didn't want to sleep with her for reasons that we can talk about in the um, for the first many years of their marriage for reasons that many of you may already know and that we can talk about later, but. Basically, uh, she was in trouble uh, as a future queen of France as long as she couldn't cement this alliance between France and Austria by giving the Bourbons an heir. Uh, and so the advice that her mother and the Austrian ambassador kept giving her was just do whatever the Louis, Louis the 16th likes, do whatever the Dauphin at that time likes. The only thing he really liked was to go hunting and riding. And so she became an avid horsewoman, uh, but she enjoyed riding astride, riding like a man. This was considered incredibly scandalous at a time when no matter how perilous the hunting or the riding or the jumping, women had to be uh, riding side saddle uh, with their legs on the left. Uh, Marie Antoinette um, not only rode astride, she rode astride in pants. Um, this portrait on the left of her painted um, a few years into her years as queen, she's actually riding astride in a skirt. And on this in this fashion plate uh, showing Marie Antoinette, she's actually riding side saddle, but wearing these kind of loose uh, breeches, uh, kind of like a, a long skirt. Uh, this gender bending look was considered incredibly shocking at Versailles, but Marie Antoinette was actually very proud of it. And the first portrait she had commissioned of herself to be distributed both to be sent to her mother uh, at home at court in Austria, Empress Maria Theresa, but also to be copied and sent to courts all over Europe was this picture of her in the center in a riding habit that really looks like it could belong to a man. This riding habit launched a, a long lasting 
costume fashion for a female garment known as the redingote, uh, a French bastardization of the word riding coat, uh, a, a man-tailored uh, jacket with none of the frills or bows that we saw in Madame de Pompadour, a very strict and clean line. Um, and the redingote uh, became one of the most enduring and important uh, female fashion staples of the of, um, Marie Antoinette's lifetime. Uh, but at the same time, it did uh, prompt a backlash fairly early on in her reign already. It led people to wonder if she, as a German-speaking Austrian princess, was um, afflicted with the so-called German vice of lesbianism, the fact that her husband wasn't sexually interested in her and she had a number of close female friends, um, prompted speculation that she was engaged in same-sex relationships and the redingot, the man tailoring and the manly poses, in fact, this portrait that she loved of herself um, uh, 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 on horseback recalls so much the was the portrait I showed you before of Louis the Fourteenth on a rearing horse. It's her symbolically uh, wearing the pants in the family, asserting herself as a kind of figure of Bourbon authority at a time when actually she had no authority because she didn't have a baby yet. So on the one hand, she's asserting her authority. On the other hand, a backlash is already beginning, saying that this woman shouldn't have this much power. There's something unnatural about it. There's something depraved about it. There's something dangerous about it. Uh, Marie Antoinette, again, we'll hear much more about Marie Antoinette's music in the remainder of this series, but I wanted to mention um, one little tidbit because it actually connects to her, one, her second most important fashion uh, development of the early years of her time in France, uh, which is her you know, revolution in women's hairstyles. Uh, Marie Antoinette, when she loved music, was apparently quite an accomplished musician and brought her childhood music tutor, Christophe Gluck, uh, invited him to Paris to um, and commissioned an opera from him in 1774, the first year of her and Louis XVI's reign. She was 19, Louis XVI was 20, old Louis XV had died, Madame de Pompadour was now already dead. Every eye really now was on the new young king and queen of France. And Marie Antoinette wanted to give Gluck, um, whom she admired and, and liked, she wanted to give him this opportunity to promote his new brand of opera. Um, when he did with Iphigenie en Olide, uh, which was briefly interrupted by the death of Louis XIV and requisite court mourning in 1774, uh, it came back to Paris, it caused a sensation it sparked a huge quarrel between partisans of Italian or um, Pacinist opera and Gluckist French uh, tinted opera. But the reason that I mentioned it in connection with Marie Antoinette is not only because we have uh, another instance of the royal tastemaker setting an important trend in music, but also because this, um, the episode and the controversy over um, Iphigenie en Tolide, en Olide became the basis for one of Marie Antoinette's early famous fashion statements known as the poof. The poof was a three foot high headdress uh, that could be decorated uh, in keeping with the wearer's own whimsies and tastes. So Marie Antoinette, uh, short, it was three feet high and it was built on a scaffolding of false hair, real hair, padding, um, uh, like cotton wool sometimes. I mean, sometimes there was like a wire under structure to it. And it, the pouf à la circonstance, as it was known, the current events pouf, could pay tribute to anything that was happening in your life, as long as you had the time and the money to get somebody to construct this edifice on your head. Uh, Marie Antoinette learned about the pouf from a purveyor of fashion accessories called Rose Bertin, whom I'll talk more about in a moment. Uh, but uh, basically, Marie Antoinette, after the, the controversy over the, the Gluck um, opera, Gluck's debut Paris opera, she launched a pouf à l'Iphigénie draped with black ribbons and a little Diana crescent moon referencing the Diana Deus Ex Machina, Dea Ex Machina, um, who appears in the opera's final act. So Marie Antoinette basically turned the poof not only into her signature hairstyle, she wore it to her husband's coronation, uh, but it became, uh, she became a walking billboard for anything that she cared about. She was always the most eye-catching person in the room. As a result, she, like Louis XIV before her, became the first female consort to appear under her own likeness in the um, fashion press. I want to go a little bit, I want to skip a little bit now just to say that there's a big backlash. People think this is frivolous, it's expensive. Uh, the pomade that held the poof together 
uh, was actually um, partially made from flour. So at a time of flour shortages and starvation uh, throughout France, it was not a particularly politically wise fashion statement to make. And this kind of the tacit hostility of this hunter shooting at the giant bird in the royal woman's poof implies that um, later during the French Revolution, when the press is liberalized and people can publish whatever they want openly instead of clandestinely about the monarchs, um, the Marie Antoinette's preference for a harpy poof uh, based on the discovery, the supposed discovery of a sea monster sometime in the early 1780s, uh, turned, inspired the people who were critical of her to say she's a monstrous woman. She is herself a harpy who's eating France alive. She's sucking its blood. She's using its resources on her ridiculous and phallic fashions. She's eclipsing the king. She's behaving without royal dignity. And uh, basically, she is the problem that we need to solve in France. Um, the, the next and last fashion that I'd like briefly to talk about, and then we'll turn it over to questions because I know I only have a minute left, um, is the fashion that she develops at her favorite retreat from Versailles, the Petit Trianon. Petit Trianon chic uh, involves un loose, unpowdered, non-poof hair, but fancifully decorated uh, straw hats and uh, dresses that are very different again from the habit de cour. Here, this is a little robe à la polonaise where the, the higher hem allowed you to kind of walk around on the grass and play in the rambling English gardens that Marie Antoinette set up at the Petit Trianon. Again, a far cry from the rigid formality of the Jardin La Française of um, Versailles. But the favorite dress of all and the favorite and most famous or infamous look of all associated with the Petit Trianon is the white shift dress or chemise or gold dress. This uh, Marie Antoinette made fashionable. It became the most fashionable dress bar none of the 17, late 1770s to the 1790s. But Marie Antoinette was accused by her critics of lacking royal dignity, of desecrating the sort of authority and dignity of the crown, and of allowing women of every class to look just like the queen. This famous portrait by Vigée Lebrun uh, of Marie Antoinette in 1783 uh, notoriously showed the queen in no trappings of royalty whatsoever. So whereas her poofs were too extravagant, her chemise or gold dresses and petit trianon chic was too underdressed, too um, undignified, too casual. And that became another uh, whip with which her adversaries beat her. Uh, when the revolution broke out, paradoxically, the democratic nature of this kind of easy, simple shift dress, no longer made of these expensive French silks, no longer built over expansive uh, whalebone corsets and huge uh, paniers or hoop skirts with long trains. Anybody could copy it, anybody could wear it. It became a very democratic fashion. And in fact, the white shift dress was adopted along with the sleek, uh, unfussy Rodangot, Marie Antoinette's other great fashion statement, these were adopted as the female patriotic uniform of people who, um, who favored the overthrow of the monarchy, who wanted to get rid of artifice, luxury, and frivolity in all its forms. At the same time, the French fashion press uh, is still showing Marie Antoinette inspired styles like the coiffure à la nation. In 1791, if you wanted to um, show your uh, love of the new nation, no longer a kingdom, but a nation of citizens, you would wear this coiffure à la nation, effectively another version of a hat à la circonstance. Um, so Marie Antoinette paradoxically gave these fashions to the very people who would overthrow her, uh, but she clung to the white chemise dress as her final fashion statement, uh, very concerned about what her last appearance would be on the day of her execution. She had kept hidden in her wretched little cell in the conciergerie in a hole between two stones in the wall, a perfectly immaculate white chemise dress that she wore to her execution instead of the raggedy black uh, morning gown she'd been forced to wear for most of her captivity. And this dress enabled her to reclaim the chemise one more time as a fashion statement uh, with her own political message to it. It now uh, signaled not a revolutionary fervor, but um, bourbon monarchist martyrdom. White was the color of the bourbon lily flower, and uh, white was the color of Marie Antoinette's final fashion statement. That's it. That's all I've got for you. And I'm, I'd love to hear your questions, comments, or if there's anything I went over too quickly, uh, please let me know, and we'll go back to that. Thank you. 
Oh, goodness. This is such a fascinating talk. I really could listen to you talk for hours about this material, and it's setting up in such great ways the musical style, um, the okay. aspects of musical style that we're going to talk about in our next um, next couple of meetings, as how is how are these aspects of taste making transferred between all of these various media. Uh, I'm happy to take questions from anyone turning on your microphone, or if you'd like to put things into the chat directly, that's also fine. You can use the raise hand function. We can also go back. I don't know. I have maybe a selfish question that I can start off with. I've been Thanks. thinking thinking recently. Oh, actually, we should let uh, Georgiana Ziegler from the, ch the, the chat go first, and then <laughs> I'll jump in if need be. I want to let everyone else have the floor. So Georgiana, and I hope I'm saying that right, um, is asking, can you say something about the women who she patronized as artists? Oh, thank you, Georgiana, for that question, because in fact, that was one of the slides I had to skip. Um, most importantly, I, Rose Bertin, the, the fashion purveyor who was uh, largely responsible for both Marie Antoinette's poofs and for the extreme dressing up of the hair, but also the extreme dressing down of the chemise dresses, she fancied herself an artist, but I think she's not really whom you mean uh, by your question. The most important uh, female artist who Marie Antoinette patronized was Elizabeth Vigée Lebrun. And um, it, it was a really important choice, not only because Vigée was one of the most talented uh, a portraitist, uh, for my money, of the 18th century, uh, but also because she was the first woman, female painter, to be chosen as a court painter to a French royal. And she had a huge influence on Marie Antoinette's aesthetic. So basically, uh, so much of what happened at the Petit Trianon, the Petit Trianon itself, the, the building had been built originally for Madame de Pompadour, but an even more pared down uh, and kind of more early neoclassical, eventually Louis XVI or Marie Antoinette style architecture, uh, that had already been built uh, before Marie Antoinette uh, took the throne or even came to France, but it was given to her on her ascension um, uh, with her husband of the throne in 1774. And essentially when she started developing these rare back to nature English gardens and experimenting with these beautiful interiors where the colors were very muted and the patterns were tiny little dainty florals and beautiful very uh, minimalist or understated stripes. Um, Marie Antoinette really found a, uh, a kindred spirit in Vigée Lebrun who, who strongly favored a kind of a um, a removal of artifice from the, the layers, not only of uh, French portraiture, but also of, uh, of French uh, upper-class fashion. So uh, Vigée herself, for instance, I thought I gave, a, I think I showed a picture of Vigée in a sort of pseudo petit triangle outfit. Um, this eau de portrait en chapeau de paille, uh, this self-portrait of herself in this loose, unpowdered hair that was one of the signatures of the Petit Trianon, but was really a look that she encouraged Marie Antoinette to adopt. She also uh, noticed that, uh, and many commentators from Marie Antoinette's era taught, who, who knew her and saw her at court talked about how her most striking feature was her very, very beautiful peaches and cream skin. And yet the, the standard at Versailles um, since the days of Louis XIV had been that um, aristocrats of both sexes wear thick pancake makeup and heavy amounts of rouge. And Vigée was the one, according to her own memoirs, who encouraged Marie Antoinette to, to sit for her without makeup and actually to not wear makeup at the Petit Triangle. So Vigée uh, was, a, was a really important influence on Marie Antoinette uh, in when Marie Antoinette was elaborating this back to nature style that I sort of uh, lightheartedly called Petit Trianon chic. Uh, so Vigée, I really can't say enough about and her importance. And, but one of the funny things too, is that uh, even though Vigée became associated with this kind of coterie of women around Marie Antoinette that maybe uh, sort of uh, furthered more rumors about Marie Antoinette's supposed or suspected lesbian proclivities, um, there was, there's also kind of a really nice, in our day and age, I think women supporting women uh, aspect to that story. And uh, to me, it, it's, it's not an accident that Marie Antoinette, who really does something even bolder than Madame de Pompadour by being the queen who dares to take the place of the king. If you were the mistress and you took the place of the king as a tastemaker, they could publish Poissonade against you, but it didn't threaten the monarchy as such. You were in a remove from the king, officially speaking. Uh, Marie Antoinette was the wife of the king. She was a crowned queen of France. And for her to assume this role of tastemaker really did 
uh, make bigger claims about what her authority was because of the rank that she held. And so for her to surround herself with other uh, powerful women, uh, Rose Bertin actually is another great case in point in the sense that she kind of quasi illegally uh, ran her business by herself at a time when the guild laws required female marchands de mode or sellers of accessories and little fashion stylings, uh, required them to be married to a male member of a mercer's or a tailor's guild. So uh, there is a great women supporting women dimension to her story, which is uh, unique to Marie Antoinette in this, um, in this segment of uh, French royal tastemaking. Does that help? Oh, that's, how does she dress her children? Yeah, somebody yeah, great. how does she dress her children? This is another area where we really see, and I'm sorry, I think I, oh yeah, I do have one little slide here. If you throw one up in there, it can all become handy. Um, so Marie Antoinette, in fact, also revolutionized the way children were dressed, royal children were dressed. Um, all of you were probably familiar with European portraits from many different um, uh, Western painting traditions that show the children of royals and aristocrats as mini-me's in these kind of uncannily, almost monstrously looking adult clothes on their tiny little bodies. Uh, Marie Antoinette uh, was not a great reader. She was not a Madame de Pompadour. Um, she didn't she didn't read the work of Rousseau and debate it, but she hopped on a kind of a Rousseauist trend that was also part of the legacy of Madame de Pompadour, this idea of you know nature running a little more wild. And she she jumped on that bandwagon and really extended it in terms of how she styled her children. One of Rousseau's um, premises in his treatise, 1762 treatise, A Meal on the Education of Children, was that um, children shouldn't be treated like little mini adults and kind of clamped into all the artifice and all the the awful oppressive he thought luxury and um and and showiness of, of adult fashion instead they should be allowed to run free they shouldn't be constricted by all the little suits and the little mini corsets and so here marie antoinette in this portrait by um her favorite swedish painter um Bert Müller from 1785 this is marie antoinette walking with her two oldest children in the gardens at the Petit Trianon and her eldest daughter Marie Therese is wearing kind of a little version of the the chemise she's wearing a kind of shift dress in this blue voile or something with a little sash and the ruffled collar which are the kind of the sash at the waist and the ruffled collar and the ribbons on the sleeves she's wearing a little, little mini gold much less restrictive than these big formal uh, hoop skirted and trained panier de cour or habit de cour and then the the little dauphin is wearing a little sailor suit this kind of little romper where enabling him to run a Around with his mother and play in the gardens at uh, the Petit Trianon. I, I didn't love the Sofia Coppola film of, of Marie Antoinette, but I really did love the scenes that they shot of her and her children outside at the Petit Trianon, uh, where they show them kind of playing in the yard. And that really was something that Marie Antoinette was known to have done. And that was a first uh, in, in royal circles, certainly in France. Uh, so the idea was that the way that she dressed these children in a more natural, less artificial, less rigid, more playful style, but also more age appropriate style uh, was another important part of her, what was called by her contemporaries, her revolution in fashion. Okay, beautiful shoes. There's a follow-up about the shoes, yes. You know, I, my first draft of, of uh, my book about Marie Antoinette, which was called Queen of Fashion, um, was about her shoes. And it was about, in particular, the fact that one of her shoes fell off her foot when she went to the scaffold and um, and it was kept by the by eventually by the city of Paris. So you can still see it. The little shoes are really interesting because they, um, there's no left or right shoe. Uh, and that was just a standard for 18th century shoemaking. So I don't have a lot more detail for you than that, other than the fact that um, these kind of beautiful fabrics and the, the sort of delicate patterns that Marie Antoinette loved in her dresses, because uh, shoes were very often made of cloth, um, where they would maybe have a leather heel and then the rest of them would be covered in cloth. The shoes tended to be coordinated uh, with her outfits and to kind of represent the same kind of style, the same preferences for smaller, more dainty patterns. She loved stripes. She loved these dainty little florals, uh, kind of understated colors. The years, her early years as queen, when she wore these really bold, bright colors, um, when she turned 30, she decided that uh, those didn't look as good on a woman with aging skin. And as a woman much older than 30, I can tell you that I do understand that reaction. Uh, but so the shoes followed suit. 
the thing that um, that you know people say that Christian Louboutin with the red soles on his shoes that uh, that that's meant to give women this sort of air of the nobility or the aristocracy at court because everybody had to wear the red soled shoes. Uh, it first introduced by Louis XIV, but in fact, red soled shoes were only worn by men. Uh, so I would like to. Um, to just correct that slight uh, misperception about why Louboutin has the red soles, although he knows his, his French royal history, certainly. Um, but so you don't even see the kind of um, uh, the showy men's shoes that Louis XIV made famous and made de rigueur for his noblemen and his um, entourage. Let's see if we can see. Like there's a pretty good Louis shoe. You can't see the red heel, but you see the diamond buckle and the big red ribbon. Uh, variations on that theme were still part of men's footwear in Marie Antoinette's day. And so in fact, Marie Antoinette, uh, whereas in women's wear, the shoe tend to take a back seat to the dress. And um, the, the other biggest fashion spendthrift, probably your fashion also leader at Versailles, besides Marie Antoinette herself, was her favorite brother-in-law, the Comte d'Artois, who later became King Charles X. And I mentioned him in connection with shoes because he famously ordered 365 pairs of shoes every year and threw each pair out after one wearing. Um, so the, the shoe consumption at Versailles was really in Marie Antoinette's day, still much more of a, of a big business for men uh, than it was for women. But yeah, if you ever get a chance to go to the Musée, uh, the Carnival Land Museum in Paris, uh, you can see the little shoe that um, fell off Marie Antoinette's foot. And even though by, by after her four pregnancies, she eventually had a, a bust measurement, according to her, one of her seamstresses books, of like 48 inches, like a gigantic chest. Her, um, her feet were apparently about the size of my pinky based on my eyeball study of that shoe. So I don't know how that worked, but there it is. Um, let's see, what motivated the move? This is, a, oh, thank you, Ryan Brown, that's a great question. What motivated the move from extreme artifice to natural st styles? And was there any way in which it was an attempt to blunt criticism and be more attuned to other trends? Uh, as I might've expected, it's an excellent question. And um, in fact, Indeed, the the poof the poof moment for Marie Antoinette, which is really what beyond the Redingote, which was really a tempest in a teapot at Versailles, and suddenly the women at Versailles who wanted to be you know in good with the future queen would start emulating this dress of the Redingote. It gradually was uh, diffused through larger fashionable and privileged circles throughout France and Europe. But the first real fashion um, frenzy that Marie Antoinette sparked in earnest and that was very public from its inception was the poof. Uh, I, I mentioned that she actually wore a poof to her husband's coronation. She was the first queen to attend a, a royal coronation in like 150 years or something like that. And so she was a very conspicuous presence at this coronation where her husband, this kind of dumpy and awkward figure is getting the big crown placed on his head and like sort of struggling under the weight. And she's sitting and is basically everybody's staring at her in the front in her little royal loge with a, a headdress so tall that supposedly her face was at the exact midpoint between the top of the hairdo and the hem of her dress. Uh, so she really very spectacularly um, burst onto the fashion scene with this poof. It attracted a lot of attention. It sparked a lot of emulation. Even women who couldn't afford these really elaborate poofs uh, were apparently bankrupting themselves and their husbands, spending whatever they could just to put little knickknacks in their hair and tease it up as best they could. So it was a very conspicuous trend. And it really met with a fairly um, uh, unfortunate end in the mid, like maybe 1776, 1777, after there were a series of bread riots where people started suspecting that the royals had been hoarding uh, bread or um, flour at Versailles uh, because of a number of bad harvests. And so lack of flour, lack of bread. And um, and Rose Bertin, the woman who uh, took credit for really inventing the poof, um, Rose Bertin did, made the unfortunate decision to uh, kind of like Prince Andrew giving a bad interview to BBC, she made things much worse when people were all are already saying, should the queen really be wearing these elaborate powdered, you know, cake-like headdresses when people are dying for want of bread? Rose Bertin actually introduced a poof. We have no uh, image of it, no image of it survived, but it was a poof of a bread riot 
showing people throwing stones through a bakery window. So it was a current event, but it was politically very ill-advised. And because Rose Bertin um, made her own name and made her own brand as a luxury purveyor in Paris by being the minister of fashions to the queen, the scandal around Bertin um, only intensified the scandal and the, the sort of the criticism of Marie Antoinette. So yes, in many ways, although Marie Antoinette had been given the Petit Trianon, this little back to nature, uh, neoclassical anti-Baroque palace in 1774, it was really in the after the bread riots and after the scandal around the poofs that she retreated there more and more. And in part, it was that, you know, she in the early days of her reign and when everybody was in love with the poofs and people couldn't believe that there was this young fashionable queen that they could just like see sitting at the opera or laughing with her friends or, you know, riding in an open carriage or something like that through Paris. Um, people, uh, people were, what I've lost my own train of thought, I'm so sorry. But anyway, um, where people had really loved this look and she was used to getting acclaim, she would show up at the Paris Opera and people would be thrilled to see her and go crazy. And in fact, people would even, according to her hairdresser, Leonora, whose memoirs are, are very unreliable but funny, Leonora claims that like people broke ribs and legs and stuff, trampling each other to see his latest hairstyles for the queen. So in the beginning, she was used to all this like fervent, um, love from the public and really with the bread riots, with the scandal around Bertin and with just the continued excess of this particular style at a time of national hardship, uh, she had the, the unpleasant and to her very shocking experience of, of being hissed at in public and being booed and being, you know, having uh, uh, unwelcoming things screamed at her. And so the Petit Trianon also became an escape in that sense, that she already fairly early on in her reign, by I would say 1777, was learning that uh, that kind of celebrity, the kind of notoriety and the kind of attention she had attracted as the center of every gaze, as the person who sets the tone, as the one who eclipses the king himself, that all of that was a double-edged sword. And she increasingly craved an escape from that kind of publicity, but also she really hated the politics of Versailles. She hated the dowdy old dresses. Um, she called the women who wore them centuries or packages because they looked like they were just kind of trussed up in these old bulky things. Uh, so she wanted an escape both from a disapproving public, but also from a court atmosphere, which she, like Madame de Pompadour in her time, found incredibly stultifying and uncomfortable. And then, as your question suggests, and as I uh, indicated a little bit before, um, the, the Petit Trianon became a kind of a place where she could, like Louis at Versailles and like Madame de Pompadour at her various uh, Maison de Plaisance, where she could uh, elaborate and articulate this kind of Gesamtkunstwerk, where everything was unified. She could try on the these kind of new, more natural dresses. She could experiment with not wearing makeup and she would do it as she'd wear a little straw hat instead of a big expensive poof. And it would all have this perfect stage setting of um, this beautifully understated idyllic little castle. And you also know that on the um, grounds of the Petit Trianon, she had a fake uh, peasant village called uh, Le Hameau, the, the Queen's Hamlet, uh, where she could go and pretend to milk cows. According to one report, the little sheep that she and her friends liked to keep there in little fashionable shepherdess outfits um, were dyed pink uh, and or perfumed. I have no, uh, I can't uh, prove that that was true one way or another, but that was what was said. Uh, so in many ways, the Petit Trianon, in addition to being an escape from and a pendulum swing against the sort of extreme style of the poof and the controversy around it, uh, it was just a chance for her to take a, a newer style and make it her own. Does that help? Ish. That's that's yeah. wonderful. And it's actually a perfect point of transition to what we'll talk about in our musical discussion next week, because we'll very much be talking about the swing away from the artifice of the old French Baroque in musical terms and how that transfers into simpler musical styles that might be analogous to some of these fashion trends. Um, I know that we're after seven, so I'll maybe end the formal festivities here. But if anyone has any final questions that they'd like to stay and ask, I'm sure that would be OK for another minute or two. So perhaps before everyone filters out, we can thank our speaker. This was such a wonderful, a wonderful talk. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you all in, in a week's time. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah. And, any other and again, if anyone wants to stay and ask a final question, I'm sure I'm happy. Yeah. Be, be okay. Merci beaucoup. Ah, oui. Thank you. Thank you very much, Caroline. And thank you. Thank, uh, you, thank you, Julia.
Uh, oh goodness. Yeah. Yeah. That would be wonderful. Do. do you know, I'll ask a selfish question as people are filtering out. Do you know yeah, much, sure. Caroline, about the, um, the inoculation poof? Oh, sure. Yeah, that's another, that was another current event poof that was an important poof à la circonstance. And um, I mean, I don't know much about it. I was never, I went back in the day, I went through hundreds or maybe thousands of, of you know, images in the various, you know, archives and libraries trying to find documentation of her poofs, you know, beyond just what the fashion engravings and fashion plates were, which were kind of a, an early version of fashion magazines. I could never find an image of the inoculation poof, uh, but it was another controversial, it, sort of like the Gluck opera poof, it, it celebrated a triumph of hers that had been um, mired in controversy before it succeeded. So, uh, so some people say that it had the kind of the the staff of, how do you say it, Asclepius or whatever, that kind of, you know, wand with the wings at the top that symbolize a doctor. Some people said that it had like a snake in it, um, but the inoculation poof was uh, meant to commemorate her success in um, persuading Louis the Sixteenth or to get inoculated against smallpox. And this, in our current anti-vaxxing and vaxxing uh, moment, it, it's something I should have thought about before today. But um, basically, the French were Louis the Four, Louis the Fifteenth, Louis the Sixteenth successor on the pre predecessor on the throne. He died of smallpox. Uh, smallpox had killed both of Louis the Sixteenth's parents, although um, he was raised by tutors who told him that they had actually been poisoned by Austrian spies, which was part of why he was afraid of his Austrian wife for many years. Um, but anyway, smallpox was hugely um, fatal to, uh, to people at all levels of um, European society. And uh, Marie Antoinette's mother and Austrian uh, siblings and family members had actually been- Oh wait, Caroline, I think you, uh, we can't hear you quite as well. You kind of cut out a little bit. Oh, I'm sorry. Anyway, um, basically, Marie Antoinette's relatives in Austria, I think her mother and maybe her older brother, who were kind of also pro-science and very interested in the sciences and the Enlightenment, especially her older brother, Joseph II, um, they were in favor of inoculation and they got inoculated against smallpox. And Marie Antoinette, having just seen the, the death of the king caused by smallpox, um, urged her husband and other members of the royal, the French royal family to get inoculated. And there was a huge outcry among the French public and at court saying, who does this Austrian woman think she is bringing this dangerous and dubious medical practice into our, into our royal family? Maybe, you know, like our, after all, Austria was our traditional enemy until the Pompadour got involved and turned everything around. Maybe she's actually trying to kill the king. How do we know? We don't want to see him inoculated, but she prevailed. And then she celebrated her success by apparently appearing in Paris in a poof called the, the inoculation poof. Uh, but it's been a long time since I've read about it. So I'd have to look again to see what it was described as looking like. But I do know that exactly like the poof à l'Iphigénie connected to this, you know, the, the quarrel over the Gluck's first opera in Paris, um, she basically was using the poof à la circonstance not just to commemorate any old current event, but to commemorate an event where her authority had been in question and she emerged triumphant. So they really, even though she was young, you know, she was in 1920 when these, when she first started wearing these poofs, um, there did seem to be a real uh, conscious determination to assert authority uh, in a very um, pointed and emphatic symbolic way through her fashions. So yeah, That's I wish I had a picture. Yeah. yeah. Are you writing about inoculation drama? Well, maybe next week there's, she actually also supported an opera at court about inoculation. So Get perhaps out. we'll talk about that really? next, next week. Yeah. Oh, I'm so excited. All right. Two yeah. operas, in fact. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Really? Yeah. And where everybody lives in the end? Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. Good. All right. That would make sense. Happy operas about okay. inoculation. Yeah. yeah. So okay. that's, that's <laughs> the spoiler. That's the stay tuned sorry. scenes yeah. for next week. Oh, I'm week. sorry. Yeah. Operas sorry. about inoculation. No, not at all. I'm so fascinated to hear more about the more about the poops. But I don't mean to dominate. I don't. I don't know. No. I no. I, thank you. And yeah. Well, and as I was saying before we started, I'm so happy finally to get to meet you here. And I'm, I'm excited. Your talk is next week, right? Yes. That's right. I'm yeah, looking forward Rebecca, to it too. Back in the week after. Cool. 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 Caroline, I know we're um, a little over, but I can't resist asking if the uh, revolutionaries who presumably inadvertently uh, adopted um, Marie Antoinette's style, thus 
paying the ultimate homage to her. Right. If there was ever any uh, indication that they at any point realized the irony of those actions. Yeah, Lisa, that's such a good question. And I, I have to tell you that based on my research, and again, like, you know, I wrote this book in 2006 and I haven't, um, I haven't done a lot of new research on it since then, but I read obsessively about this for like 10 years and uh, never did I find anybody admitting like, oh, hey, look, our new patriotic uniform is exactly what we were saying we hated the queen for wearing way back when, um, you know, but it, I think also it, the picture does get a little bit confused by the fact that Many of the people, for instance, who were indignant about the Queen's presumed or, you know, seeming lack of dignity, this lack of royal iconography, the lack of the trappings of royalty in these, in like in this famous, uh, infamous Vijay portrait, a lot of the people complaining about that were um, monarchists who just happened to hate Marie Antoinette. So, uh, you know, she had different audiences criticizing her fashions at different times. And I think a lot of the vitriol came from conservative nobles and courtiers about this dress, but not exclusively. I mean, this this portrait was hung at, in the Louvre at the Paris Salon in 1783. And it was so, it provoked such a scandal among the general public that Vijay had to replace it a few days, like literally I think a few days later with essentially the exact same portrait, but showing Marie Antoinette in a variation on the, the habit de cour, wearing good French silk and nice French luxury products of this lace and stuff. And this is a poof, but the ostrich feathers are, are very expensive. And so they kind of qualify as royal here. And she's wearing these great, incredible royal pearls. So there was, you know, you could say that maybe, you know, the casual dressing of the little white shift dress was something that especially nobles worried about their prerogatives and their distinction from the rest of kind of hoi polloi of, of uh, France would have been the biggest enemies of this dress. But in fact, the general public was also really offended that their queen wasn't doing the job of looking like a queen, even though when she looked too elaborately overdressed, they were also not that happy about it. So it really, I mean, my the conclusion I came to it, in the end, I didn't phrase it this way in my book because it it's so it sounds so banal and it is, but basically she was damned no matter, at a certain point she was damned no matter what she did. And she was damned in part for having made herself a target by seizing the role of royal tastemaker and uh, definer of kind of cultural prestige in France and articulator of cultural prestige in France. But on the other hand, there are so many other complex historical and political factors that were making the monarchy's days numbered um, even before she got to France. And she became a very convenient lightning rod for, for profound discontent all along the political spectrum. But yeah, I mean, it irritates me so much every time still to this day when I look at these you know, revolutionary era fashion plates and you see like, what about any of these outfits does not say Marie Antoinette. Like I just, it, 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 none of it doesn't say Marie Antoinette right there. And yet these are the patriotic uniforms of the people who, if they could afford them, um, were, you know, on the side of, of the revolution. Yeah, thank uh, you for that input. It's fascinating. Sure. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Sorry. I know it went quickly in the end. I just, I hate going over and, um, I hate reading from a thing, so there yeah, it is. It's just such a rich, mm -hmm. a rich subject matter. There's plenty more to explore. Unfortunately, we'll have um, some extra time, you know, as the weeks go on to, to return to some of these questions. Cool. Cool. Well, I look forward to mm -hmm. it. So, yeah, are we, are we calling on we'll, today? Yeah, I guess that, that calls it a night. Thank you so much for this wonderful, rich presentation. And I look so much forward to hearing, um, hearing more from others um, in the weeks to come.